Uh, let's bring in a member of our extended family, Jim Trotter, longtime NFL reporter for NFL Media, also co-host of the Huddle and Flow podcast with our boy Steve Weish. Uh, Trot, I don't know how much you uh, you heard us go back and forth over Brian Flores' decision to pull two at the end of the Broncos' loss yesterday. You've covered this league for a long time. What'd you make of that move? Um, I, first of all, I heard both of you. And the one thing I had to correct you guys on is you guys said you were bringing on someone smarter than you two to talk about it. So uh, you must have a guest <laughs> coming on after me because that's not that's not me. So it's on you, baby. It's all on you. <laughs> that's you. That, that said, I will give you my thoughts. I, I'm with Michael Smith on this one. Look, when you make that change, you ride or die with that young quarterback and he's going to have growing pains. He's got to go through this. So to me, what I look at, too, is I think the Dolphins whether they will admit it or not, are ahead of schedule in their rebuild. And I think now, as a coach, as a competitor, all of that is an organization. You want to win when you have that opportunity. And they have that opportunity now when many of us thought, again, this would be a rebuilding year for them. And next year would be the year that maybe they start to take off. And I think that Brian Flores got a little hungry. He saw a chance to win a game potentially by making a change, and so he pulled his young quarterback. And I'm not going to say he's wrong, but I am going to say that when you make that change, in my opinion, you ride or die with that young guy unless he's just so far in the deep end that he's going under and you're afraid he's not going to come back up. Well, I, I think I, I just I think you're both wrong. But anyway, uh, that's fine. Thanks for coming on. Uh, uh, try well, it, it, wouldn't time. 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 it wouldn't be the first time. It wouldn't be the first time. All right. All right. Hey, thank you. We'll see you later. No, uh, no. In all seriousness, but I, I would look at it this way. You're right. They are ahead of schedule. So, Jim, if you're ahead of schedule and, and you're Brian Flores and you're thinking, okay, we're not going to win the Super Bowl this year, I'd, lo I'd love to. I know we're not going to do it. I need to develop some good habits uh, in Tua Tagovailoa. Some of those habits can be developed during the game and then we can watch film. Others, hey, in this tough situation, I got to take him out and I'll talk to him during the week. But right now, we got Ryan Fitzpatrick who's capable. I'm going to put him in here and still stick with Tua. What's wrong with that? I, don't, I just don't see a problem with that. What's wrong with that? Well, again, my, my feeling is that you ride or die with that quarterback. You don't, you don't play around with his confidence. So does he have to look over his shoulder every game this year if he doesn't come out like gangbusters and play well or the team gets behind? You don't want that in a young quarterback. The other thing I will say to you is that in watching that game yesterday, it wasn't all just him. I mean, the Dolphins up front were not playing well at all. And so, therefore... You're putting it all on this young quarterback at that time. And look, Fitz came in, he moved him for a moment, and then he makes a critical turnover, which is kind of Ryan Fitzpatrick's history. Uh, but again, and my, and my, and my feeling is you learn, I, I feel, and I've always felt that I learn more by my failures than I do my successes. And so mm -hmm. therefore, if I'm Tua, I want to play it through. I want to be in there during those tough moments. I want to see my team, I want my teammates to see me fighting with them um, throughout the difficulties. And look, I, I understand Brian Flores wants to win, and he said it was just a performance issue on this day. But again, I say I, I would stay with the young guy. Once I make that commitment, I'm riding with him. Uh, meanwhile, in Philly, uh, Doug Peterson Ooh. committed to Carson Wentz. What the hell happened to Carson Wentz, man? Well, if, if I'm playing the guessing game here, I would say, number one, the talent around him was not great. He had the injuries. He was off on that MVP caliber season the one year. Um, he gets hurt. Foles comes in, leads him to a Super Bowl. And after that, in my opinion, you saw the talent level around him start to decrease, particularly at the wide receiver position. And again, this is one thing, as you guys know, having been around this league a long time, when you invest in a young quarterback or you draft a young quarterback up high in the top five, um, you better put parts around him for him to be successful because he's the answer to all the questions. And the, the, the Eagles have not done that. Um, their wide receiver core last year was god-awful. Um, this year, they're having trouble protecting. And I just wonder now if it's gotten in his head where he just simply is not playing well. So hmm. at this point, I don't see it getting much better, which is, is sad to say in a year where that division, you know, hell, you could win that division with six wins this year maybe and, uh, <laughs> yeah it might be know? five no? <laughs> yeah it might it might be five and and look i picked the eagles before the season to win that division so uh, 
it, 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 he just looks awful. I mean, if you, if you talk about ever wanting to pull a quarterback because his confidence level does not appear to be where it needs to be, I would say Carson Wentz is that dude. You know what, uh, Jim, I look at this. Uh, uh, when I look at Kansas City and Pittsburgh in the AFC, it's one team is defying cliches and the other team is confirming cliches. So the, the defiance is Kansas City Super Bowl champ. It's hard to come back after winning a Super Bowl to stay focused and maintain that same level. Okay, throw that out. Not, a, not an issue. But with Pittsburgh, it's we well, don't have a quarterback that can make all the difference in the world. You saw what they did last year. Eight and eight with like three or four quarterbacks. I think it was three quarterbacks. And then this year, 10 and 0. So if you match them up, theoretically, conference championship, who would you go with? Ooh, that's a tough one. Um, I would say this to you. I thought last year was invaluable for the Steelers from this standpoint. Without Ben, other people had to step up and got experience, particularly on the defensive side of the ball where they were so young. And we saw that defense start to mature faster than maybe it would have when you have a quarterback like Ben who can cover up some of your blemishes. So to me, I, I do think last year was, and, and this may sound strange, was a blessing in disguise for the Steelers and has played a major role in why they are where they are today. You take a team, as you say, that nearly made the playoffs last year at 8-8 eight and eight, with some of the worst quarterback play in recent memory. I mean, their quarterback play was god-awful. And now you plug in a, a future Hall of Famer at the most important position on the field to go with the development of all those other guys, I think is critical to the Steelers' success. To answer your question, um, who would win? I guess I guess at the end of the day, I'm, I would probably go with Kansas City from this standpoint, um, based on conversations with Patrick Mahomes even earlier, trying to get in his psyche and understand him a little bit. The marriage between his ability and Andy Reid's play calling and play design is as good as anything we've ever seen in this league. And so when he gets into those moments where a play absolutely positively has to be made, as we saw last night against the Raiders, I just would have to put my money on Patrick Mahomes and Andy Reid in that situation. So, and it is only for that reason that, that if you ask me to choose one, I would choose them. I do believe the Steelers are the more complete team, the more balanced team. I believe their defense is, 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 uh, defense is better than Kansas City's. But, man, Patrick Mahomes is like the eraser, you know? And whatever blemishes you may see, he just erases them. And he, he's just he's truly going to go down as one of the all-time greats, I believe. And I believe part of that, I believe in my heart, is because he was put into the best situation possible when you talk about matching his abilities with Andy Reid's um, play design. Um, I'm going to take it back to when you and I first met. You spent a long time covering the league in general, but the then San Diego Chargers in particular. So you, you, you covered Breeze in his early years. You covered Phillip Rivers. Don't forget we spent Ryan a lot of time Lee. in this show talk. Oh, Don't yeah, Ryan, Ryan Lee. Lee. Bottom, bottom, Ryan, same category of beer, exactly. You know? uh, <laughs> but no, we, we spent a lot of time in this show talking about Tua. Uh, we mourn for the rookie season of Joe Burrow. But my yeah. favorite out of those three guys is Justin Herbert. Yo, what are you seeing and what are your people around the league saying about the prospects of this kid? Like the Chargers, different, different city, same franchise. Look like they got another one for real. Yeah, no question. Um, there are some who think he's the best quarterback out of this draft class, uh, to be frank with you, when you talk to some personnel people. Yeah. Um, number one, let me give some props to his quarterbacks coach, Pep Hamilton, who is a Howard University graduate. But I think Pep has done a tremendous job in bringing Justin Herbert along. Number one, even before Justin was ins inserted into the starting lineup after that injury um, to Tyrod Taylor, he was preparing him as if he were going to start, as if he were going to play. He would not let him accept that this was going to be a learning year in terms of standing on the sideline and learning from a veteran like Tyrod. And, and Pep challenges him. And the thing that I like from what I've heard is that Justin likes to be challenged. He likes to be coached hard. He's receptive to teachings. And so when you watch him, guys, as, you, as I'm sure you've had, there's nothing he can't do. Um, he's got the arm talent. He's got the intelligence. He's got the mobility for someone who's 6'5", 6'6", um, who moves really well and is a danger in that way. The only flaw I see with him at this point 
and understanding that he's going to continue to develop and every player has flaws in that. But in terms of the maturation, maturation process, the one thing I see with him right now he's got to learn is stop taking big hits because mm -hmm. he has taken some tremendous shots along the sideline, even in the middle of the field, that they are trying to get him to avoid so that obviously he stays healthy and they have a better chance of winning. Now, now listen, Jim Trotter, I'm, I'm aware that Howard University has had some fine, some fine alums over the years. I mean, we got we got Thurgood Marshall, we got Tony Morrison, we got, we got Jim Kamala Trotter, Harris, Kamala and Harris, Kamala Harris. So that's I really wanted to go there because I Debbie think when we Allen. had you on, <laughs> we had you and uh, uh, Steve Weish on, and we were talking about HBCUs and. Um, just like the, the impact of what that did for you, you know, graduating from HBCU. But what was it like when you not only you find out that Joe Biden has has picked Kamala Harris to be his running mate, but then on November 7th, believe it or not, it was November 7th and we still haven't. Some people still haven't conceded, but I digress. Uh, on November 7th, it becomes official. What does that mean for you? Uh, what does it mean for uh, Howard University? You know, truly what I think, what I thought about more than anything is, is, um, is what I heard other black women say, that look at Kamala, you can do this. It's now achievable. And I believe, I've always believed that representation matters. You know, one of the reasons I pushed so hard for Bill Nunn Jr. in the Hall of Fame this year, and, and he's now a finalist, he has to, you know, we have to have the vote on him but because there are no black contributors in the Pro Football Hall of Fame. And my point is, if I am a person who is never going to be good enough to play in the National Football League, you know, I would like to think that there, that there is a way I could see myself in the halls of Canton. And so, you know, once you see it, you believe it, that you can achieve it. And so for me, that's what Kamala did. She now has set the example for those coming behind her and those little black girls who may one day aspire to follow in her footsteps to say, you know what, don't ever tell me what I can't do. I can look there and say, yes, it's possible. So, so that was first and foremost for me. The fact that she's from Howard, look, no question, there was, there was bison pride there. Matter of fact, she and I graduated the same year. Um, I can't say that I, 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 no, I can say that I did not know her on campus, but I can't say I never came across her on campus, but, um, just immense pride, you know, that someone so intelligent, um, someone with so much um, thoughtfulness in terms of, of social consciousness and decency and humanity, all of that. Um, no, just pride, man. If one word sums it up, it's just pride. You know what? Let's stay on the yard, man. Let's stay at the Mecca because I actually was going to bring this up with Michael later. And for some reason, uh, it just hit me to ask you about it. Uh, not to put y'all on the spot, you know, I told Michael the other day, Trot, I don't watch sports, I watch movies now. <laughs> but not quite a movie. And listen, I'm not, I, and, and I'm not an audio book guy. Not an audio book guy. I still feel like I have to, like, physically Absolutely. read the book myself. However, I'm all for adaptations and productions and performances like they put on at the Apollo Theater in 2018, and like I watched on HBO Max last night, not sure, speaking to Howard alums, ta Coates, his Between the World and Me, they adapted it. Did you, did you happen to get a chance? To, I know you were watching football. Did you happen to get a chance to see it? Highly recommend you watching the adaptation on HBO Max. You too, Michael. It was incredibly beautiful uh, and moving and just as powerful. I, I felt the same type of emotions listening to you know, uh, Felicia Rashad, uh, you know, and, um, you know, the, the list goes on, you know, of, of actors and actresses, you know, last night uh, just reciting his words. Um, I'm drawing a blank right now, but there's so, too many to name. But the reason I brought it up, though, man, is, is we know how uh, influential the Mecca and the Yard were to, you know, the ball one of our times and, and Tana Hasi Coates. We know what it, we know what that meant to his development. Can you and I, I found myself try, watching it last night, saying to myself, and I love my four years at Loyola New Orleans. Don't get me wrong. Loved it. All right? But if I had to do it all over again, man, and I mean this, I'd have gone to Howard. 
just to be just to be around that kind of black excellence, just to be around that kind of brilliance, man. So just a little bit more kind of unpack just what it was like walking around the yard and the Mecca and that community and the development and, and, and what it meant to you as a man, not just as a professional, but as a man, as a black man. Yeah, no, no, no question. Um, you know, I think I can speak for my, my co-host, Steve Weish, on this too, who's a Howard grad. We both went to PWIs before we transferred into Howard. Um, him, he was playing football someplace else, and then he transferred in. And for me, I was saving money because I didn't have the money right away to go to Howard. So I had to spend a couple of years saving that up, and then I, I transferred in. And right away, for me, what I will never forget is that I felt at home. You know, I, I, I had gone to predominantly white high schools um, and, 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 you know, when I was younger. Then I go to college for two years at a PWI. And the minute I landed on campus, and as you say, you're around that black excellence, um, I felt at home, but I also felt a sense of responsibility that they, it was going to give me everything I needed. And it was up to me then to take it, to internalize it, and then to make it into whatever I could make it. And I, I never felt like a number there. I felt like a person, which I think is, is so mm. important for young people real. today. Um, and I always say this, the, the, the greatest compliment I could give to Howard is that I graduated in 1986. I'd say the same year as Kamala Harris. And if you ask me today to do it all over again, which school would I go to? I would say I would go to Howard again, if I could choose any school yeah. in the country just because of what it did for me. Um, there were opportunities, you know, you were the only one who, who stopped yourself from achieving if you were there. there. We had, like, being in communications, we had our own TV station. We had our own, um, we, what we called then the Bison Information Network, where we would go out and shoot our own news. We had two newspapers. So from a communication standpoint, everything was there for us to be successful. And then you had instructors who would, who would hold you accountable, uh, and, you know, one of my first broadcast journalism instructors was um, Dr. Lee Thornton, who has since passed away, but she was the first black female White House correspondent. And she didn't take any gruff and she didn't cut you any slack. And that's what you need in the world. She prepared you for the real world. Same thing with Professor Sam Yed, who is no longer with us, but was um, one of the great journalists and minds of our time. They prepared us you know, for the real world. And I'm being long-winded here, but I'm just saying to you guys. No, you're good. I, that's why I was looking for uh, it. Yeah, like it, it. There's, just, there's, there's just something to be said for being someplace where you feel at home, where you feel valued. Um, and yet at the same time, there are expectations of you. You know, no, one, no one's going to go easy on you because um, you're competing um, while you're there because you do have some of the great young black minds just minds, period. Forget black minds. You have some of the great minds in the country, if not the world, there, and they're all aspiring to do something great. And if you don't match that, you'll be left behind. So, uh, man, I owe Howard so much, and that's why I always get a kick out of people saying, you know, man, that Howard arrogance and this that, and the other. Oh, and my man, point is always, like, wait, but Mike, when I hear that, my response is always, Shouldn't all of us feel that way about our university, our alma mater? Yeah. Because yeah. if you don't, then there's something wrong, right? Yep. Yeah. Absolutely. That's, that's good. I, that's like great said, stuff. If I if I could if I could do it all over again, I, I'd be right there with you, brother. And no disrespect to Loyola, I appreciate that what they gave me. But man, I would have loved to experience what it was like to uh, to be around Mike, that environment. And, and Mike, there's still opportunities, man. Like you know, Howard University Law School. You go to law school and get your yeah, 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 yeah. No, for for sure, for market. sure, for sure. But I I, I would just be going for the education, no. Not that this not that education ain't top notch. Oh, wait a I would minute. Strictly be going to school and that's it. You know, <laughs> as your attorney, I wouldn't be as your attorney you know? <laughs> in this situation. I'm going to advise you to stop. <laughs> okay, I exactly. To stop. No, but seriously, I'm going to advise tell you. you both. The only way Good I got through it, I think. Because I, I know what I know what Mr. Holly is getting at here, and the only way I think I got through it is I was a true nerd, man. So I was I was like into my books. You wasn't you, was, you wasn't Billy D. Williams back then. You wasn't bro. you wasn't this smooth dude. <laughs> I'm, I'm still not smooth. I had that one woman I met in, in my Lord. first two years in college before I transferred to Howard. It's the same woman I've been with all this time. So no, there's Amen. nothing. 
there's nothing smooth about me here, bro. It's um... no, but listen, I, honestly, like I just want to emphasize this. I watched it uh, last night. We've all read the book, but uh, just again, because I was drawing a blank because it was so many, and I was asking a question at the same time as Mahershala Ali, Angela Bassett, uh, Angela Davis is in it. Um, you know, Wendell Pierce, MJ Rodriguez. I mentioned Felicia Rashad. It is one of the best works of art that I've ever. It is such, such a beautiful. Wow and moving and powerful right. representation of the beautiful struggle that is the black experience in the United States. I, I can't recommend it enough, so I just wanted to make sure I, I will watch it tomorrow. I'll ask you about that no, hour. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Yeah, no, and as you're watching it, I just want to point out to you, I, I listened very closely to what you said about Howard, and I heard a lot of beautiful things, and what I heard you say, Jim Trotter, is you had some professors who didn't give you any slack, Ooh. who held you accountable, who understood Circle. that you were competing. I know where he's going. I know where he's going. Hey, Brian Flores, Professor yep. Flores, to the student, Tungo, Mr. Tungo Bailoa, this is not acceptable. Sit right <laughs> here because we're trying to get you to another level. Oh, I'm out. Oh, Michael, I'm, like, I'm I, out. But I, I, I like how you cherry picked that and you forgot. When yeah. I said they hold us accountable, they gave us our D or they gave us our F. <laughs> But they never gave up on us. They let us stay in the game. Okay. Oh, he ain't give up. Go. Oh, wait, but he ain't give up on them. Now stop it. He, ain't he gave, gave up on Sunday. Said, he gave up on pay, Sunday. And those professors certainly didn't pay you as much as uh, as Brian Flores <laughs> slash Miami hey, paying to a tongue of Iloa. <laughs> Hey, man, keep keep doing amazing work. Uh, again, the Huddle and Flow podcast. Uh, check it That's out. Great. Always dropping some wisdom with Steve Weish. Thanks for falling through, man. We'll talk to you later. Appreciate uh, you, man. Some, we got to make some time to get you guys on with us, man, so we can have the truly smart people on the show. Uh, hey, let me say word, this we go. When we have you on, you can't be wearing a tie, man. We're at home, okay? No I, ties. I, know. I had some. I had a previous engagement. I had a previous engagement. <laughs> I didn't have time to change. <laughs> but, yeah, we'd love to come on, man, anytime. Give us a shot. All right, we're going to bring you. Hey, thanks for watching Brother From Another on YouTube. Make sure you hit subscribe before you leave and be sure to watch us 3 to 5 p.m. Eastern Time on Peacock. Appreciate you.